Hello, everyone. Welcome, if you're new to the room. Uh, this is Adit. He works at ABSA as a data scientist and is going to tell us about machine learning moving into production. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Adit. Uh, I'm a data scientist at APSA. Uh, just like quick background. Um, so I'm currently co-leading the team at APSA. We're uh, like a cross-functional team, uh, multidisciplinary between data scientists and engineers. Um, and we've been on a really interesting journey this year. Um, well, actually, in the past two years or so, in basically pivoting from multiple POCs to actually getting models running in production and adding value in real time. Now, it's great when you get to that point, but uh, the journey along that point is to get to that point is what's really interesting, and I think it's what a lot of people discover um, iteratively, you know, as you go through this and experience it yourself. So um, I've noticed that uh, this is quite a, a prominent theme here at the conference this year, and that is like a lot of people speaking about uh, moving from experimentation to production when it comes to machine learning. So I'm going to make sure that I don't uh, cover a lot of what was said, but in fact take you through a bit of a different approach. So in talking about this journey, hopefully there's something for everyone here in this audience. All right. The first thing is, if you're a data scientist or engineer who's working on machine learning, um, you may have experience or not, uh, but what you will leave with this this talk with is tools and technologies which you can use to actually take you down this journey. All right. Secondly, if you're perhaps from some sort of a business function um, and maybe you're responsible for leading delivery itself, what I'll actually uh, impart to you, and it's arguably my uh, biggest intention today, is a way to approach data science projects. All right. How do you solve them? And um, tying in with these two points, are essentially the lessons which uh, we as a team have learned in going through this process. All right. So let's start by talking about what typically happens. All right. So some of you may be quite familiar with what I'm about to say, but business have approached us. All right. They've got a problem they want to solve, and um, we've had the initial chats, and they tick two very uh, important boxes. The first one is, Business have a big problem that they want to solve. Value, tick. The second thing is they have data, all right? Tick. Now, data scientists' eyes start lighting up because those two boxes tick. Therefore, we can play and we can add value, all right? So everyone's really excited. And uh, so the data scientists go, they grab the data, and they start playing with it, right? And um, this is what you start to see over the course of a week or two, all right? What you're looking at here is a number of notebooks that seem quite chaotic. I mean, let's just quickly eyeball some of the names. We have uh, myself doing some initial analysis. We have Ash, who is experimenting with different model architectures. We've got a notebook that has done some clean data for the month of October. Um, we see our friend Michael over there is running multiple feature experiments some with the delta t parameter, some with time features. So this looks quite chaotic, right? But as far as the data scientists are concerned, they know exactly what's happening, right? They're following this. They're having fun. Even more concerning, though, is what the data files look like for these notebooks, all right? Um, we've got some data that's been sliced, the first 10,000 rows of August data. We've got, a we've got a CSV that's called Final Features. We've got something that's called final, final features. We've got final features before go live and a host of other data files. OK. Yeah, OK. So that was a gimmick, right? I created that to show the point. But um, what I should have done is actually just taken a screenshot of one of the guys in my team's <laughs> directories from there. Um, so it's a mess. It's really a mess, right? Um, but again, the data scientists know what they're doing, right? They know what the problem is they want to solve, and they know how they're going to solve it. If we had to just do a quick pup freeze on one of their local environments, you'll find hundreds of libraries that are already installed locally. All right? Um, and the chances of them using, God, maybe 10% of these 
is, well, sorry, like more than 20% of these libraries is highly unlikely. All right. But now we've gotten to this interesting juncture where your data scientists have done a whole lot of work, right? They've prepared, uh, they, they've built some models, they've done a lot of experimentation, and they're going to present some results, OK? And they're showing business these results, and business are excited because it looks like, hey, we're actually going to solve this problem that we've been given. So business are like, OK, how do I get this to touch my customers? How do I consume these in real time with real data, all right? And then we get to this lovely, lovely little conversation that happens, all right? Where the data scientist ideally wants some function which will convert a notebook to production-ready code, all right? And all they want to do is they want to call some magic function. And this magic function must do, well, magic, right? So programmatically, something like this doesn't quite exist. All right? And so we're at this weird point where a lot of people experience tension between, hey, I've got data engineers in my team. They meant to ship code to production. I've got data scientists, and all they have to do is give me results given data. All right? And this is what we're all looking for. We're looking for magic. The thing is, magic may exist. All right? And that's where I present to you what we call the eight-week agile production cycle plan. All right. And the idea behind this is to move from, prob from problem statement to production in eight weeks. All right. Now, essentially what this is, is just an eight-week plan split up into weekly sprints, where each sprint has a very, very specific purpose. All right. Starting off with sprint one, in any data science problem, research and doing a proper literature review is key. All right, so in sprint one of our production cycle plan, the focus is simple. You know what the problem is. Go and do as much research on it as you can. Go and read papers. Go and watch tutorials. Go and read blog posts. Um, you know, go and clo clone code from GitHub. Play around and understand what is the beast that you're dealing with. All right, and the reason this is also very important is because typically, People, like data scientists, know what techniques work for what type of problems, right? But at the rate at which the industry is moving, um, you need to basically de-bias yourself by taking a new look, a fresh look at the industry and the landscape at what is out there, all right? And what this enables you with, by the end of this sprint, is probably algorithms that you could apply, new techniques, new technologies that you could apply to solving your problem. So. Moving to sprint two, EDA. So EDA is, um, EDA is extremely important because, again, we need to understand what is the data we're working with. We now have this view of the landscape that's out there around what tools, technologies, techniques we can use, but we need to understand our data. And how does that data, well, how does, the, how does what we saw from our literature review inform the context we're working in, all right? Now, as far as Python is concerned, there are a host of tools and uh, libraries, frameworks that you could use to get your EDA done. Um, and really, they, they, they're amongst the, the common ones that everyone does know. Uh, Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, Seaborn. Um, I'm putting a special shout out to like, this library, Pandas Profiling, because it's like, really accelerated EDA for my team. But I must warn you, just take it with a pinch of salt. There's some dodgy things in that library. Um, <laughs> And uh, like, I mean, like if you've got licenses, then like Tableau is a fantastic way to visualize data in like higher dimensional spaces, all right? But at this point, you're leaving the data scientists to, ex to experiment within their Jupyter notebooks. Don't take them out of that habitat yet, all right? Sprint three and four then, once you've understood your data, will focus on feature engineering and model selection, all right? So you know what is the data you're working with, and you now have an idea of how you need to use this data, all right, given the literature you've, uh, you've discovered. Now, those suite of tools pretty much assist you in your feature engineering and model selection process, all right? And I must reiterate this. By the end of sprint four, well, within sprints three and four, your data scientists remain in their Jupyter notebook environment, okay? 
they're comfortable, they're doing a whole lot of unstructured things. Um, and at this point, they're now getting a really, really good idea of how they're going to solve this problem. Okay. So we get to now a very, very interesting point, which is the pivot. Okay. And what is the pivot? The pivot is essentially this point in our eight-week plan where we have to move away from this experimental environment and start adding a bit more structure so that we can actually get production-ready code. All right? And that brings me to Sprint 5, which is where the pivot takes place. Now, in Sprint 5, the idea is to focus purely on model development. Can you build the best possible model to solve the problem that you're trying to solve? All right? And over here, common frameworks and libraries that are used for this are Keras, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, TensorFlow, you name it. You find one, you work with that, you get the best possible results. All right? But part of this pivot, uh, in order to get this pivot right, sorry, requires you to understand a few new ways of working. All right? um, a, few, a set of disciplines and rules that essentially need to be followed for us to get this pivot right. So the first thing is understanding that you have to have a way to repeatably train your models, that it takes consistent input, returns consistent output. Okay. And the reason that is key is because in this model development phase, when you're running experimentation still, you need structure in order to find what is the best part. You're going to be experimenting a lot, right? And in order for you to... Um, manage all these experiments and find the best possible output, you're going to have to have a repeatable process. So automating your training script is key. The second thing, uh, sorry, just on that, uh, a very useful tool which can be used for this automation is basically uh, setting up like an airflow DAG to run this, right? If you know what data you need and what output uh, you want from that, then airflow becomes a really, really powerful tool coupled with Python here. The second thing is the automation of your predict function. All right? Now, you could be predicting uh, on batches of data, or you could be predicting on basically like single observations. But essentially, that predict method needs to be automated. And the reason for that is because you need to, you're, gonna, you're going to be running this process several times. And in order for us to track the progress uh, in, finding, in finding the best possible results, automation is key. All right. Now, with all of this, it's crucial that data scientists get comfortable with version control. And it's something like our team really uh, struggled to come to terms with, but eventually, like, we just, um, it was like a non-negotiable, right? Um, version control in terms of your code and data are key. And so if you're not using Git, for your code base and managing that, you're going to run into problems. Secondly, a tool which we're starting to play around with now is DVC, which is great for managing like um, versioning your data. All right, it's essentially Git for data. Um, and the reason this is, I'm, I'm going to come back to this. The reason why all of these things are really important is because again, model development still forms part of this experimental phase. Right, we're finding the perfect pickle file. We're finding the perfect set of weights. All right, and that requires experimentation. But the structure around that starts to allow you to avoid a lot of technical debt. All right. Another thing that's uh, key in this model development phase is managing your environments, right? Um, and so a, a, a really good principle to almost follow is to make use of Docker on your local. All right. And that's because when you're moving to shipping, to a different environment, a development environment, or a production environment, you've got your image, you're sorted. You won't run into any problems. Um, so an interesting thing we experienced here is we we're making use of uh, a particular version of scikit-learn on one person's local. And then when it came to testing that in dev, the version had changed, and the predictions were off by like 0.1. Right? Now, it may not seem significant. Sure, it requires like a bit of context to understand. But that 0.1 residual actually causes significant differences in what we report back to business. All right. So managing your environments and your dependencies is absolutely important if you're going to move to production. Okay. So at this point, let's just take a quick checkpoint. 
we've done some literature review. We've gotten a lay of the land. We know more or less how these type of problems need to be approached. We've then taken our data. We've analyzed our data. We've uh, understood it properly, so we know how to use that data, given what we know about the landscape. Then we went and we've engineered some features, because if we engineer our features and we use our data in a particular way, we're going to get good results. And the way we're actually going to produce results is by finding the perfect model file. All right. So we've gotten to this point where you've essentially got the perfect set of weights or the perfect pickle file. You name it, your model is ready. The question is, how does that now go to get served in production? All right. And that's where we get to Sprint 6. Now, prior to actually moving to uh, refactoring your code, um, I'm going to say something that is potentially controversial, but um, yeah, I'm curious to see what your views are on this, right? Um, as far as model optimization goes, uh, everyone would be working in different constraints depending on the problem they're trying to solve, right? So a unique constraint which in one of our cases we had to work under was that we needed end-to-end -end predictions in 100 milliseconds, all right? Now, in order to achieve that, that becomes quite tricky if you're using a lot of these, uh, if you're using like Keras uh, or Scikit-learn, which, you know, essentially are like wrappers over something that's a lot faster, all right? So we found that we weren't getting the, the, the prediction speeds that we needed, right? Um, and at that point, I know a lot of people would rush to saying, let's go to C++. Let's rewrite this stuff so that it actually is closer, um, so that it runs a lot faster, okay? I'm going to challenge that, and I'm going to say, don't rush to C++. And the reason I say that is the, re the, the approach that we took in trying to get this performance output that we wanted was to actually take some of the model architectures that we were working, at, working with, which weren't very complicated, and writing them from scratch in NumPy. All right. That way, you remove a lot of the fat that a lot of these APIs have around them, which slows them down a bit. Okay. Now, agreed, this here really just depends on the... It, it's pretty much a trade-off between what resources do you have available to you in terms of skill, capacity, and time, and is it worth the effort, all right? So if you've got really great C++ devs who can rewrite autoencoders from scratch, that's great. That works for you. If you don't have those resources, well, think about what you're solving. If it's just matrix multiplication, then NumPy can do it for you really quickly, all right? So model optimization is typically something that happens once you've found you know, the perfect model file, and all you want is performance improvement. Now, when it comes to refactoring, this here is essentially the crux of moving to production, right? What you want to aim for is essentially a standard model serving template, okay? A template which all data scientists in the team working on different models can follow in which they plug in the stuff that their model is going to do. It expects standard input of data. It can make predictions and then send those predictions to wherever they need to go, all right? And involved in that is essentially like creating a predict wrapper template for making your predictions. Now, all of your feature creation code essentially gets written and modularized in this predict wrapper template and then just gets called in like a standard predict function that's exposed in your production environment, right? Um, and part of refactoring is also forcing data scientists to focus on unit testing, all right? There have been numerous, numerous bugs which we've been able to solve just by uh, getting to unit test, just by focusing on unit testing. Now, please understand that this is like, this is a journey for data scientists, right? We're talking software engineering principles which we are fundamentally against, right? Because it challenges our experimental being, right? Um, so test-driven development, we all know is ideal. Um, chances are your data scientists are gonna be hacking their way around these tests, all right? <laughs> Accept it, understand it, look out for it, and it'll correct itself over time, all right? Um, and, and again, like I'm, I'm just speaking from experience, this is something we've observed in our team, um, and with the right testing processes, 
we were, able, we were actually able to debug a lot of production issues really quickly. So now, essentially what you've got is this template that is able to serve in production. You can give it data. It's going to do whatever it needs to do in terms of feature creation, data manipulation. It's going to call your model. It's going to make a prediction. And all of this is contained in a beautiful, beautiful Docker image. And your environments are contained, right? So at this point, I would say that your work as a data scientist is pretty much done. So the final two sprints in this eight-week production cycle is essentially doing things like end-to-end -end testing and then the actual deploys to production. Now, it depends on what production environments you're working with and things like that. Um, but like typical steps that are involved here, which um, in our case, like software engineers mainly handle, is managing like integration tests to other systems, making sure that our models are producing the correct uh, predictions in a dev environment as they did in our local environments. That way we know that we can trust the scores that we get in production. All right, and um, so at this point, data scientists should be happy, all right? Um, the engineers should be happy. Now, what we've gotten to is, hopefully, by the end of the eight weeks, you've got code that's been deployed into production. It's serving, it's running, it's, it's all working out really beautifully. And um, so if we just take a quick recap at what this magic was that we were looking for, right? Data scientists are looking for some magic to take place in order for code to move to production, all right? Now, this magic may not happen programmatically, but magic actually is happening in this entire cycle, all right? If you have a problem and you make use of the right tooling, you end up doing the right things. Simil uh, following from that, if you're following the right discipline with the correct principles, you avoid technical debt. And if you have committed team, uh, team members who are doing hard work, you end up getting efficiency. And that is how you take models to production in eight weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got time for questions. Hi, Edith. Thanks a lot. That was a really great uh, presentation. Uh, I recently did an Agile course, and the Agile coaches are obviously very dogmatic about how Agile is done. And I see that you, the way you've done it is probably quite a bit different to the way the Agile orthodoxy. So maybe I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about some of the decisions like um, having your literature review inside the sprint rather than before the project. And I think if I were a pedant about Agile, the, the criticism would be that it seems like it's just waterfall. You're doing one step at a time rather than doing everything recursively in each sprint. But I'm sure you've got good reasons for that. So it would be cool to hear some of your thinking around that. Sure, sure. OK, so I think like um, as far as like traditional, like proper Agile principles goes, we followed some and we didn't follow some, right? And so things that we did to basically, which I would say differentiate us from a waterfall approach, is this continuous feedback, OK? So one thing that was non-negotiable with the team were daily stand-ups and highlighting problems at those stand-ups. The second thing is every Friday, we hunted business down and we sat with them and we showed them what it is that we were moving towards. That way, when we got to a point where we were showing them results, they understood the journey we've been on. That's actually very challenging, getting them to sit in the same room with you. Um, so uh, the daily stand-up approach, the weekly retros, the sprint planning, that stuff we followed with a lot of discipline, right? Um, I would say like things that we, we weren't super pedantic about is, uh, I suppose, like the, um, sorry, so, so things that we did also follow are like, proper code reviews and things like that. Um, I'm going a bit blank. What, what is that like second part of your question, sorry? So I think, yeah, thanks. So like, it seems like you sort of 
doing one step at a time, whereas I think like a purely agile person would say, put a very dumb model into production in sprint one, make your sprints two weeks, do four two-week sprints, put like a logistic regression into production in sprint one, and that's tested already, and then just iterate and make it better and better and better in each sprint. So that would be like the, I think, a purely agile approach. So maybe understanding a bit of the reason why you've done it in a more sequential way. OK, sure. So, so in our case, like, uh, time was a big constraint. We had to prove value quite quickly, right? And so this eight-week production cycle didn't allow for a lot of um, iteration between sprints. So let's say we got to the end of sprint, uh, sprint three, where we've, we've, we've engineered some features. Um, and we found that, hey, maybe this feature could be done differently. With us, it was almost like we're going to cap it there because we need to hit this target, which is go live on the state, right? Um, once we went live and we did a bit of back testing to analyze results, we moved into, we moved into like our second production sprint uh, cycle. Um, in that case, that production cycle was not eight weeks long, but actually four weeks long, where we went back to uh, areas where we saw we could get some further improvement. So with us, continuous improvement wasn't, I would say, sprint after sprint, but rather production cycle one, here's MVP. Production cycle two, here's an improvement on top of MVP. Um, there was used, no, you, okay, there's a question over there. Thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, firstly, how realistic is the eight-week sprint to get everything into production? Mm. Um, and the second question is, does your entire team work on, or your entire, yeah, does your entire team work on one project okay. to get this eight, yeah, at a time, sorry. Sure. So, so um, little caveat on my presentation. I, I don't want to be prescriptive about the eight weeks. Um, in our case, that's what we had initially like thumb sucked. We're like, this is what we need to do in order to get the problem solved, right? Um, in terms of like the mechanics of our team itself, um, because like I said, like, like I said, we were cross-functional. We had the data scientists who had like their track, which they could follow for the eight weeks, and then the software engineers almost like were building out the platforming in parallel. So, in terms of like setting up our streamers to stream data into our architecture, um, exposing like. Uh, a client service for our model store and feature stores, um, those were handled by like the software engineers. And so a lot of work was done in parallel, which happened to work out for us in an eight-week period. Um, I think there's different things which would inform how long your production cycle is. Um, complexity of the problem, how many resources you have at your at disposal, and um, what's, what's the urgency from business? Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. Cool. Do we have, oh, we've got the front. Thank you. Um, something I've noticed that seems rather un underrepresented is um, data quality and cleaning. <laughs> so what I've typically found, I mean, in EDA, you start working through the data, and then it ends up the data quality ends up being foobar, yeah. completely foobar. Mm -hmm. So how does that fit into the life cycle? And usually that causes a lot of delays, at least in my experience. Sure, sure. Okay. So uh, a bit of context on like this journey we've been through, which has been over the course of this year, right? Uh, beginning of the year, we tried to push stuff into production for within four weeks, right? It is a complete disaster because of that issue. We didn't understand the data we were working with, and so a lot of the lessons in our case with the data cleaning were learned early on, right? So the data cleaning, when we got to this point, we were able to, like, I would say, like, in a lean way, move to production. Um, those lessons were already learned. If you were tackling a problem, like, from scratch, then there's probably like a few days or even like one week sprint prior to EDA or perhaps with EDA that you would ded have to dedicate to sorting out your data quality. Um, the data we worked with was nice in the sense that it was structured, but it was like quite horrible. Like, yeah, 250 columns per table, NAND values in God knows how many duplicates and like the, everything you ex you'd need to solve in a Kaggle competition we had to try and solve it with our actual data. So definitely allocate time for that if you're going to be doing this planning. Do we have more questions? Um, there's one at the back here, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Hello. Hi. Um, you 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 mentioned um, unit tests, and um, in my experience, a lot of data scientists would argue that um, unit tests are things that they they they're not supposed to be doing. So. Um, how do you like what what are some of the arguments you can put forward because from a, from a dev perspective they really are but in terms of convincing a data scientist because they would argue that their job is just to make analysis and uh, deliver on the problem that they were given but never touching on unit tests so what are some of the points you can use to convince a data scientist okay that this is something that they need to do sure so the first uh, first thing is iron first no, I'm kidding. No. Um, so, so actually, um, that that convincing is difficult. But here's here's how we almost like ha how it played out for us, right? Um, on one of our models, essentially we get uh, we, we we get back some features from our feature store, and these features are in a certain sequence. The model we're building is a sequence model. Therefore, the order of the data is essential, right? It just so happened that the way the data is returned from the feature store. Um, is not the way the model accepts it, and therefore the model needs to reverse those sequences. All right, um, and so we kept running our predictions, and we're like, why the hell are our predictions off if the data is coming the way I expect it to come? And it turns out it wasn't right. Um, and a simple unit test had allowed us to basically discover where that error came from, and that was like basically an aha moment for everyone in the team, like. If we're not actually testing our feature creation functions, if we're not testing our predict functions, then we're going to end up with these problems. And debugging those problems in like a dev and prod, in, well, you don't debug in prod, but, um, but yeah, you, you don't want to, you'd rather catch those locally than wait to experience them in some other environment. So in our case, experience, I suppose, was the convincing factor. I'm not sure like how else other than yeah, lessons we've learned from the past for data scientists to learn because, well, they want data, right? And then they're going to base their decisions off data. So let them get data of mistakes. Yeah. Hi there. Okay. So um, we have the luxury and the curse of working at scale um, with a substantial amount of data and volumes. Um, so I was wondering. Um, what you've presented here, is that with respect to that sort of use cases, or was it mostly small data that you would find in calculable competitions and so on? No, massive, massive. So for, for context, um, so we're in the bank, right? So our models, are in this case, are predicting of transaction data. Um, on just like one data set, uh, we get like 16, uh, we get about a million transactions a day on average. Um, and so, well, in a month's time, you know what that plays out to. And so, in this case, like, we're intercepting transactions directly from the mainframe, every single transaction that hits an APSA platform. Um, so, in our case, definitely uh, a big data problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and, like, I think, like, the software engineering around that is, that was, that was like, quite a feat for us. Um, just just a, an FYI, like, if you're not using Kafka, man, like, you need to use Kafka. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? <laughs> Coming a problem. Okay, so again, at scale, right? Sure. Data versioning, how do you do it? Pick your pardon? Data versioning at scale, how do you do it? How do okay. you version tens or maybe even hundreds of terabytes of data? Okay, all right. So, so as far as production data goes, well, we're not actually versioning production data. We just logging that, right? So we've got like our own Elk stack set up, and then we've got our logs set up, and Kibana, and all those beautiful tools. Um, from, the training, from a training perspective, what we've done is uh, with Airflow and DVC together, we've essentially been like getting the versioning right. So like I said, DVC is something we only just recently started to play with. But essentially, um, data for which our final models are trained on, that gets versioned and popped somewhere. Um, we've got schedules for Airflow that run, uh, DAGs that run on a daily basis to pull the data we need, and then our retraining would take place like monthly, and then we grab all the data we want. Um, so at this point, we're getting to the stage where uh, the versioning is coming right, but we're not there yet, if I have to be completely honest with you. So DVC, we think, is the way to go. Right. 
Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, there's just one announcement. Would people who are doing lightning talks please meet here in the ballroom at 20 past three? Thank you. And thank you, I did.